chapter is a prayer. It is a doxology. And Psalm 150 is no different. It is the final prayer of the entire song book. It answers several questions. Where to offer praise? Why God should be praised? How God should be praised? And by whom should God be praised? So as we study Psalm 150, I'll read it as I do every week, and we'll come back through with key verse, key phrase, phrases, or key word or words. So Psalm 150 reads, Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and the harp. Praise him with the timbrel and the dance. Praise him with string instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. So as we go throughout Psalm 150, what do you believe would be the key verse within this whole chapter? What's that? Verse 6. And why would we go over verse 6? It's, well, that's exactly what a key verse should do, summarize everything up. But yes, verse 6 summarizes everything up because it's talking about people, God's people, praising the Lord. And that's exactly what we have reiterated in verbatim in verse 6. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. What do you think would be a key phrase or phrases within this passage? Praise. So that could be a key word. But what about a key phrase? More than one word. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. I'd also have praise him because you have that phrase in there quite a bit, which means exactly the same thing. And if we go to key words, there's really one word that's repeated over and over and over throughout the entire song. And that is the word praise. Praise. I mean, you can't go too far without tripping or stumbling over the word praise somewhere in Psalm 150. So praise is absolutely essential to this psalm. If we would look at Psalm 150 and study and try and discover if it was quoted anywhere in the New Testament, it does not appear that it was quoted anywhere in the New Testament. There really is no history behind Psalm 150 that I could discover. And if we would try to dive into the psalm as we have in years and weeks past, there's really nothing to point to that this is during a uh, brain for a particular event or a particular time frame. All we have is that everything that hath breath praise the Lord. According to um, uh, Keith L. Brooks, Christ is seen in this psalm as the first psalm began with blessed and ended with blessed. The fruit of the blessedness of meditating on God's word is now shown in the last psalm, which begins and ends with meditating on God's word. Oop. Let me get back up. Though, yeah, yeah. yeah, and is now shown in the last psalm, which now begins and ends with hallelujah, or Praise. Those who are blessed with all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus will end their course on earth, one abounding in unhesitating hallelujah. And as we all know, that does go for absolutely everybody. Because there's coming a day when every knee shall bow and every tongue, it doesn't matter if you serve God, whether you worship Him in His life, whether you acknowledge Him as God or Lord of your life. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're Hitler, Mussolini, or Adam. Every knee and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Therefore, the ages will end 
with one resounding hallelujah. As we begin diving into Psalm 150, we begin with that phrase, Praise ye the Lord. As we jump into it, we have exactly here what the whole theme of this whole passage is about. Praise ye the Lord. And then it begins telling us where we should praise God. It says to praise Him where? In the sanctuary. Who is this God that we're praising? The name used means simply Lord. The sacred name. It was Yahweh. It was that name that was so precious that the Jews would wash themselves before they would write the name, wash themselves after they would write the name, and destroy the pen with which they wrote the name. It is that name that the vowels disappeared from it, and all we are left with is the consonants, because the name was so precious that they deemed it so sacred that they would not even spell it all the way out. But we come to that word, Lord. He is all in all. He is sacred. He is El, the Lord Almighty, and we are to praise him in the sanctuary. Where is God's sanctuary? We enter into the sanctuary this morning, into this place, into this church. We enter into that sanctuary when we go in our prayer closet with him during the day and we close the door to the world. Where is the sanctuary? The earth is the Lord and the fortress thereof. Where is God's sanctuary? God's sanctuary is wherever he's at. Wherever we walk on holy ground. For Moses, his sanctuary there on the backside of the desert was the burning bush. How do we know that there was a sanctuary there? Because he was struck to take off his shoes. Why? He was on holy ground. Who shall ascend into the hell, Lord? And who shall stand in this holy place? What is this holy place? It is the habitation of God. It is the place where his throne dwells. And it is his holy hill. It is his sanctuary. Anywhere can be God's sanctuary. And we know where God is. There it is holy ground. And we need to praise him that God still desires to dwell in the midst of his people. For that has been his longing from the very beginning. To come down and commune with us. Praise God that he still meets his people. Praise him in the firmament of his power. You know that God is all powerful and all righteous. We can all go back, I'm sure, through times in our lives where it seemed impossible for us to get through, where it maybe thought that this was the end. I don't know how I'm going to go on. But what brought us through? It was the presence and the power of God. How did those situations get resolved when they should have never been resolved? How did that bill get paid when it should have never been paid? How did the checkbook balance out when it should have never balanced out? How did so-and-so receive a healing? Only because of the power of God. God is powerful, and we need to praise Him because it is pure, it is holy, and it is righteous. And we are God's people. We are His hands extended on this earth. The power that we have when we lay hands on the sick and they recover is not your power and is not my power. When Elisha crossed the Jordan and smacked Elisha's, Elijah's mantle on the water and the water parted, he didn't say, where is the power that lies within this mantle? Where is the power that Elijah gave me? Because the power that Elisha had, he had a double portion. And Elijah promised it to him. But his power did not come from Elijah. His power did not come because Elijah's mantle rested in him and the power resided in that mantle. But that power came from God. How do we have that power of God working through us? 
when we are holy and when we are righteous. God's power exceeds everything. But God is looking for a clean people with pure hands and a pure heart. That doesn't mean that God will use, won't use other people, people that aren't living right. Because God will use whoever he has to. But God desires to work through his people. And if we expect to see a mighty move of God, it's only known to come when we are living right. That we can experience the power of God in our lives, moving. Because God never said that he would work for the sinner. But we are his children and the sheep of his pastor. And he only wants good things for his children. And he said, don't worry about tomorrow, what you shall eat or what you shall drink or what you shall put on. God has already made provisions through the power of his might. Praise God in the firmament of his power. When we look at God's power, it's not limited. The devil's power is limited. He can only do so much and he can only do what God allows him to do. But God is omnipotent. He is all powerful. He is the only one that can create something out of nothing, reach out and hang that something on nothing. God is the only one that can bring life into existence. And we need to praise him because he is the only one who is worthy of all praise. Nobody else has creative power like that. The devil can do things, but he can't create. He can only mimic and mock. He is like you and I. We can only work with what we've been given. How do we have a pew? We didn't speak it into existence, and we didn't create it out of thin air, but we took something that God had already created to create something that we can use in this church. The devil cannot create something out of nothing. Only God can do that. He is all-powerful. He is omnipotent. He is the only one that can speak and bring things into existence. He is the only one that can speak and slay hundreds of thousands of the enemy at one time. We are informed that at the Battle of Armageddon, there is a sharp sword that will proceed out of the mouth of Jesus Christ. What is that sharp sword? It is the Word of God. When we go down to verse 2, praise Him for His mighty acts. What mighty things has God done in your life? What mighty things have God kept you from? How did God move in this situation when it seemed impossible? Were we worthy of having us delivered from such a situation? Were we worthy of the work that was done on the cross of Calvary? Were we worthy that he should take the stripes upon his back after Adam lost our healing in the very beginning in the garden? God has done so many mighty acts in your life and my life. He's done so many mighty acts that we would go back throughout the Bible and start counting how God works for his people. He brought the Israelites out of Egypt, a place that they should have never been in the first place. God never told Abraham to go to Egypt, but he went to Egypt. God never told Isaac to go to Egypt, but famine came. Natural circumstances that came, and they went to Egypt. Joseph ended up in Egypt, but they were never to remain there. And eventually God brought him out. But when he did it, God made sure that everybody knew who brought them out of Egypt. It wasn't one of the Egyptian gods. It wasn't the god Baal that they worshipped there in the wilderness as Moses was on Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments. But rather, God brought them out and he made sure that he, everyone knew who brought them out. Because every single one of those acts that God did, the lice, the locusts, the frogs, it was a direct soul of each one of the Egyptian main gods to show them that their gods couldn't keep them. There's only one true God, and that is Jehovah. As we start, continue going down even farther.
Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. You know, really, we are not worthy of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. We're not worthy of what God does in our day-to-day -day life, making sure our bills are paid, making sure that there's food on the table, making sure that there's clothes on our back. We are not worthy of it all. But what God does for us as His children, He doesn't do it because we're worthy. What God does for us in our own personal life, drawing us close to Him, He's not doing that because we are worthy and deserving of it. He's doing it because that's the desire of His heart. Jesus Christ dying on the cross had nothing to do with our worthiness, but it had to do with the fact that God wanted and desired to have fellowship with us in the first place because he loved us. And we go all the way back to the garden. Why was Adam created? Because God desired to have fellowship with man. And he came down and communed with him in the cool of the day. When we look at the veil of the temple, man didn't rent that temple veil. Man didn't tear that veil in half. But rather God did. And that veil that was six feet thick, and I don't remember how high, where did the terror begin? At the top. Was it because we were worthy? No. That there behind the veil was the place where God's throne was. That was where God dwelt on earth. That was his throne room. And when an unworthy man entered into the throne room, those bells stopped on the bottom of the high priest's garments. And why did they stop? It wasn't because God knocked the wind out of them. It's because God took the wind out of them. His life force. That man that had sin in his life and he was not worthy to be in the presence of God. Man is not worthy of the presence of God. But God desires to have fellowship with man. And that has been the desire of God's heart all along. The Son of God did not come just to heal the sick and to raise the dead. That was not the main intention of Jesus Christ. The main intention of Jesus Christ was to come and to seek out and save those that was lost. God is the only one that is worthy. And because he is worthy, he is worthy of our praise. Because really, in the reality, we all should be going to a sinner's hell. We should be doomed for eternity. The only reason we can sit in here today and say that I'm on my way to heaven is because there's only one that's worthy, and that is God Almighty. He alone is worthy. And because He is worthy, because of His excellent greatness, we need to praise Him with everything that we have. In verse 3, the Bible states, Praise Him on the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the psaltery and the harp. When we get down to praising Him with the trumpet, and we get to Jewish culture, there's only one group of people that was worthy of blowing the trumpet. You know what group was worthy of blowing the trumpet during the feast? The high priests. Those that were in charge of the religious system, the overseers, they were the ones that were given the command to blow the trumpet. They were the ones worthy to blow the trumpet. They were the ones given the responsibility. And there was power, especially within the shofar itself. The shofar is very prophetic to begin with. I've seen a picture of this past week that showed a ring of fire above the city of Jerusalem that was taken years ago. And they were going over whether it was Photoshop or it was this or that, that regardless. And if God was at work and the shofar was blown, that could have been the angels of heaven standing around Jerusalem, praising God, giving worthy, maybe ministering to the Jews themselves, putting things in motion. But the high priests were the only ones allowed to praise God with a trumpet. But then you get down to the psaltery and the heart. Who are given the responsibility of praising God with the psaltery and the heart? The high priests had the trumpets, but the Levites, those that did the grunt work in the temple, the ones that maintained the candlestick, that trimmed the wax, that trimmed the, the ash off and the soot, that kept the candle burning, 
those that minister before the Lord, as Zechariah did with the table of it, golden altar of incense. They were the ones that were allowed to praise God upon the psaltery of the heart. And then we get down to with the timbrel and the dance and the string instruments and the loud symbols and the high symbols. Who were those that were given the responsibility? It was everybody else. We have all three groups of people mentioned right here. The high religious leaders, the laymen, the congregation, and the common people. We are all commanded to praise God with everything that we have. If we get to the prophet's burial and those common women over, as soon as they crossed the Red Sea, when Pharaoh's army was destroyed, what did they do? They broke out the timbrels and they started praising God with the timbrels and the dance. God is worthy of our praise in every aspect, in every form. As long as it is pure and holy and is honoring to Him, all God is worthy of all praise because it is due Him. Not because we are worthy, but because He is worthy. Not because we are righteous. The only reason that we are righteous right now after salvation is because our righteousness is not our own, but it is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Because our own righteousness is as filthy rags. But when we put on the righteousness of Jesus Christ, we can praise God in purity and sincerity and holiness. And because of everything that God has done from beginning to end, should we not praise Him? Is He not worthy of our praise? Even if we are in Job's position, where we are sitting on a mound of ashes, and sackcloth and ashes, and in our uttermost place of despair, should we not praise God? Is He not worthy of our praise? Has He not done enough for us throughout our lifetime? And if that is not enough, should we not praise Him for remembering the promises of His Word? For I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Should we not praise Him for not always leaving us in this situation, but we know that the promises of God are yea and amen, that He will make provisions for every single day, and that while it may be dark and gloomy now, there is coming a day when the sun shall shine again in our life. There are better days ahead. God is worthy of all of our praise. And Psalms 150 ends that way. We come through 149 different chapters. Some praising God and saying, blessed are they that do this, and giving us instruction, and blessed are they that do that. Prophecy concerning the coming of the Messiah, where he will be bruised and beaten for our iniquities, how he will be crucified, how he will be betrayed. We come through all the songs of despair that God created me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. But Psalms 150 is basically the end of the day. This is the end of the book. And we've gone through so much. And we've seen the promises of God. And we've had our ups and we've had our downs. But through it all, God's been faithful. Through it all, God's been right there. Through it all, every step of the way, he was no farther than the calling out of his name. And because of that, it doesn't matter your position in life, whether you're rich or you're poor. It doesn't matter your position in life, whether you're the religious leader, whether you're part of leadership, or whether it seems like they're the person sitting in the sinner's pew. As long as we have accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and we've been living right, at the end of the day, we can praise God because we can say, through it all, God's been good. I might have had my ups and my downs, but through it all, God's been with me. I may not have been faithful the way I should have been at every single walk, but every time I want to come back, God's always been right there. He's been faithful to me. In those situations where it seemed like death was right there, that I could reach out and touch him, there was someone else that was right by my side the whole time. He's been faithful, guiding me, leading me, never leaving my side. I may not have always felt him there, but I've known that he's been there. I may have never seen the workings that God was doing in the background, 
but he's always been working everything out for my good. Those times when I thought that God had left me far and was far from me, when it seemed like those times were getting difficult and more difficult, looking back now, I can see the hand of God working. And because of things that I've done or other people have done, those difficult times had to come in that order because all that was was God rearranging the pieces to make things come out for his glory. That I may be lifted up and that he would be magnified. That I may not come out on the bottom. But that through it all, people would see that God has been working on my behalf. And I am his child. All those times people criticized me. And they didn't realize what they did. I placed it in God's hands. And God took care of it. And in the end, he receives all glory. In the end, he receives all praise. And because of that, it does not matter on where we are this morning in life, whether we're rich, whether we're poor, whether we have it all, whether we don't have half of it. As long as we have Jesus Christ, we are rich no matter what. We have something that this world cannot buy nor take from us. There is something that we should not even be able to even put a price tag on because our salvation is so precious. Our relationship with God is so precious. And because of it all, we can say, praise God in his sanctuary because wherever I am, he said he will never leave me nor forsake me. Praise God in the firmament of his power because there were situations when I look back, there's no way that things should have worked out the way they did. Praise God for he is omnipotent. He is all powerful. And when the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord raises up a standard. He is all in all. Praise him for his mighty acts, for all those things that we've seen God do in our life that he's kept us from, and from all those unforeseen things that we did not see with our physical eye, we don't even know came into existence. There is coming a day that heaven will reveal all the times that God kept us. And praise him now for her, because there's coming a day when every tongue shall confess that he is born. But why not praise him now? Why not praise him now in purity and holiness? Why not praise him now? The world is praising their gods. Is our God not worthy of all praise? Regardless of who we are, is God not worthy of our praise? Regardless of where we've been, or is God not worthy of our praise? Regardless of where we are now, may we not forget that God is worthy of our praise. Let everything that hath breath Praise ye the Lord. Anybody have any thoughts, any questions, anything they want to add at this time? May we never forget, no matter what life throws our way, in every situation, we need to praise God. Even if we do not feel like doing it, then we need to praise God. You know when people experience deliverance from things, deliverance from sin, deliverance from oppression? It's not when they're up here begging God to deliver them. It's when they realize that God has been there with them and they can throw their hand in praise. Deliverance comes in the praise. God inhabits the praises of his people. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and will do. Lord, we thank you that you're God who reigns on high and that there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke any attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels on the four corners of the property above and below that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be in one mindset and one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth, that the Holy Ghost may move in making himself visible as he so chooses. Anoint the song leader and the musicians, Lord, as they praise it. Leave some of the songs you'd have us to sing as they praise you upon the string instruments and the vocal cords. Anoint the pastor's mind and his lips as he brings forth the word today. And I pray that you'd anoint our minds and our hearts to work. Help us to keep them clean and holy for you, Lord, that we may remember your word, that it would not fall on stony ground, but rather, that, Lord, that it would fall on good ground, that we may remember it throughout the week. But even greater than that, that we would apply it to our hearts, Lord, that we would tra be transformed 
into your very image even farther. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. How you doing, Brother Max? Good, I'm good, thank you.